Hey everyone out there, I have another fun announcement from the Parthenon Podcast Network. As you know, the history of the papacy beyond the big screen and organized crime and punishment are members of the Parthenon Podcast Network. Today I have a preview episode from fellow network member Josh Cohen, who hosts a podcast called Eyewitness History. I've collaborated with Josh many times, and I have a bunch of collaborations in the works with him as we speak, so I, you are likely well familiar with Josh and his work. In this preview episode, Josh has put together a con- compilation of some of the highlights of eyewitness history. You'll get a taste of interviews with such diverse topics and guests as survivors of the Columbine mass shooting, agents who took down Pablo Escobar, and even MTV VJs, and so much more. Enjoy this preview, and then make sure you go over and subscribe to Eyewitness History Podcast on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or your podcatcher of choice. Links to all the episodes that Josh has included in this compilation and much, much more can be found in the show notes. Talk to you next time. Hello, listeners, and thank you for tuning in to this compilation episode that I created specifically for my partners in crime here at the Parthenon Podcast Network. I am Josh Cohen, host of the Eyewitness History Podcast. Today, I want to showcase nine different interviews I did with an incredible range of people. This first interview I want to present was my interview from last year with Frank DeAngelis, former principal of Columbine High School. He was present during the infamous Columbine Massacre, and here I ask him to take me back to that fateful day of April 20th. 1999. So when I ran out of my office, Kiki went down one way, I went the other, and as soon as I came out the office, on my office doors, my worst nightmare became a reality because I encountered the gunman. And um, I remember it so vividly, and everything just seemed to slow down. And later, what I learned was You go through something called fight, flight, and freeze. And I went through and I thought I walked out very calmly, but I remember very distinctly what the gunman was wearing. Baseball cap turned backwards, um, white cutoff t-shirt, black vest, boots. And I just remember the shots being fired and glass breaking behind me. And all I kept thinking about, and it just slowed down, all I kept thinking about what it was going to feel like to have a bullet pierce my body. Because I had never in my life encountered anything like that. And so I thought I walked very calmly, but I actually sprinted towards a gunman. And I know when my secretary, Susan White, and Kiki Leva saw me later outside, they were shocked. Because the last they saw me, I was sprinting right towards a gunman. And I've had police officers say, Frank, why? You're unarmed. Why did you uh, sprint towards one gunman? And one reason, one reason only. My girls, I had some kids that were in trouble. And there were about 25 girls that were coming out of the locker room to go to a physical education class, and they were unaware of what was happening. And I hurriedly got them there, and I knew in my mind that if I got them into the gym and we'd be able to shut the door, and then once I was able to check outside to see if it was safe, because there was a report of snipers outside, snipers on the building, I said once I got them outside, we'd be in a safe place. Well, Everything was going as planned. I'm keeping them calm. And then all of a sudden, I pull on the gym door, and it's locked. And we're in trouble. And the girls are screaming. The girls start praying. And literally, the gunman is turning the corner. We hear the sounds of the shots getting closer, the boots on the ground. And I had about 35 keys on a key ring. And I I was a principal that I wore a suit every day or sport coat every day. I reached in my pocket, and the first key I pulled out, I stuck in the door, and it opened it on the first try. And it wasn't that this key was specially marked. And now when I go out and do presentations with people, I said, if you need to get to that key, if you need to get to that button, you need to be able to do it quickly. This key was not specially marked. It was just mingled in with all the others. And I was so fortunate to be able to do that on the first try, because if I didn't, more than likely, I wouldn't be conducting this interview and those girls would have died. And it was uh, several years ago, a uh, Columbine girls softball team was playing in the state championship. And so I, I'm at the game and all of a sudden a young lady comes up to me and I recognize her. She was one of the girls with me on April 20th. And she's crying. I'm crying pretty emotional. And she spins me around. She said, Mr. D., 
do you see that girl there in right field? I said, yeah. She said, thank you for finding that key because that's my daughter. And if you didn't find that key, she wouldn't be playing in this game. And it got very emotional. And so it was from there, I immediately went outside. And the thing that's so disturbing, and it's there's no one to blame, but it was a protocol at the time to secure the perimeter. Right. You know, and we had a school resource officer that was at ex, uh, exchanging gunfire. And he was being told that you can't go in until the SWAT team arrived. And that was one of the most frustrating things in talking to the three or 400 people that were trapped in the building. They were being told help is on the way. And all of a sudden, all these officers are arriving, paramedics are arriving, but no one's coming in the building. And I got outside and I was actually helping the police officers draw floor plans. Uh, at one point, they were going to put a body armor on me to go in the building and shut off the fire alarm because it was so loud that the police could not, the SWAT team could not communicate once they did arrive. And so by the time the SWAT team got there, it was about 58 minutes after the original shots were fired. And and it's not the police's fault. I had defended them to the very max because that was a protocol. And I even was on the street with many of the officers who were friends of mine, and they said, you know, this is crazy. We've been sworn to protect and serve, and we're standing outside. But that was a protocol at the time. Now you look at the protocol, first officers are immediately going in. And most of these events are over within three to five minutes. So that's what happened on that particular day. The next interview I want to bring you is from the podfather himself, Adam Curry. Adam is known more or less as the creator of the podcast format which we certainly go into during the interview. But here, I want to bring the story of when he was a video jockey working for MTV and was asked by the president of the network, Tom Freston, to present an award to Michael Jackson. The first one, I suspect you'll even know which one I'm going to refer to, was when you interviewed, not interviewed, but um, you introduced actually Tom Freston. Uh, yeah. Michael Jackson. Yeah. There, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> Who, yeah. And, and, uh, he awarded Michael Jackson the Vanguard Award. Um, I know there's an interesting backstory to why he was awarded the award, but I'd love to, yeah. yeah, I'd love to ask you if you can recall that experience, what that experience was like. And then also, I know there's a interesting thing that I, I've seen you pull in regarding dishonesty in, the, in that medium. Yes. <laughs> Would you want to screen all that together for me? Yeah. yeah you've, uh, you've, uh, you've done your homework well. Oh, yeah. So. Michael Jackson, uh, a deal, the television is all about deals. And so Michael Jackson had a deal with MTV. He would perform on the Video Music Awards, which is a big deal for MTV. It was our, you know, our big annual 4.0 rating show. That was huge. You know, you got a lot of people watch. Five million people watch. That was crazy for MTV. But in return, and I'm not sure if, it, if he asked or we offered, but he was going to have an award named after him, which would be the Michael Jackson Video Vanguard Video, Video Vanguard Award of the Year. Which I think now has just become the Video Vanguard Award of the Year. It's like he's dead. It's like, eh, you can drop the Michael Jackson part. But it was supposed to be the Michael Jackson Video Vanguard Award of the Year. And <laughs> for whatever reason, Michael decided as part of the deal, Adam has to give it to me. Uh, but Adam's wife at the time was very pregnant and, and, you know, she was Dutch and didn't have anyone. We didn't really have infrastructure. If you're going to have a baby and I'm going to be in Los Angeles, we lived in New Jersey. At the time, it's like, and that's going to be a problem. So, like, no, send downtown Julie Brown or somebody else. I, I, I got to stay with, uh, you know, with my highly pregnant wife. Uh, no, this, no, no, we, you got, we need you, and and you got to be in L.A. in two days. You, it has to be you, otherwise this deal falls apart. So what they wound up doing is they flew my uh, mother-in-law in on Concord. <laughs> I tell you, she took the supersonic plane when it still existed. And so she flew in and she stayed with my, now, by the way, our daughter wasn't born until later. And as she was, you know, had to have C-section. So it never would have, it would have, it would have been horrible if I wasn't there, but luckily nothing happened. So I go to LA and go to MJJ studios and it was really interesting. So we walk in and right away, Howie Mandel was there and he's doing Bob, if you remember Bobby's world, he's doing Bobby's world voices for like maybe 20 kids who are in some kind of, you know, like school situation there, which Michael Jackson funded. I think these were underprivileged kids. 
And so we get ready, and Tom Freston's there, and because um, of course Freston needed to be in the mix somehow. I'm, I'm not sure why he got. <laughs> maybe maybe Michael wanted him there too for the legitimacy of the, how how big this award was. Yeah. And we were we're ready to go, and there was already someone who was you know uh, what's the uh, windexing Michael's pants, you know, to make them nice and shiny. It was kind of weird, like you know, he had these pants on that had to be windexed, and we're getting ready to go. <laughs> and Michael's not a small guy. I'm six four. He's well, I had my hair, so I was probably seven feet with the hair. Ah, and, uh, and, and, yeah. and Michael, and Mike, I'm ready to go. And he says, Oh no, hold on a second. And then he calls Bob over. Bob was a guy, kind of do anything guy. He whispers in his ear. Bob calls back with the apple crate so Michael could stand on it and be almost, you know, at the same height as I was. It was very bizarre. It's like, okay, you want, you want to be like that? That's fine. And, and then we, uh, and yeah, and then I gave him the award and, he was very gracious and really nice, and uh, and he did the awards. He did the MTV awards, and we did name the award after him until I think uh, J Lo got it, and I didn't hear the Michael Jackson words anymore. <laughs> so it dropped away. Next, I want to bring you my interview with the infamous CIA agent Valerie Plame. Plame will undoubtedly be known to more than a few listeners as the woman who unceremoniously had her identity leaked by the Bush administration back in 2003 in what became known as the Plame Affair. So July 6, 2003, former Ambassador Joe Wilson, your husband at the time, now ex, who was sadly passed, writes an op-ed in the New York Times. This is titled, What I Didn't Find in Africa. Criticizing, as you pointed out, Valerie, the Bush administration's claim that Iraq had sought to acquire uranium from Niger. So my question is going to be, when were you first aware of the op-ed? And did you have any indication or sense that it could cause trouble for you? <laughs> it came out July 7, 2003. I knew that for the previous months, Joe had been trying very hard to get to the bottom of the so-called 16 words in President Bush's State of the Union address of January 2003, where he talks that we have learned that Saddam Hussein has sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. Joe knew otherwise, but why did that, this speech, this State of the Union is the most highly vetted speech that a president gives in any given year. So how did that line get in there? So he's quietly going behind the scenes and speaking to his former colleagues at the State Department and on the Hill to say, how did this happen? So ultimately, there were a couple other precipitating events, but he decided he was going to write this op-ed, what I did not find in Africa. And he spoke about his trip to Niger the year before at the behest of the CIA, not me, to go get to the bottom of this alleged transfer of 500 tons of yellow cape uranium. And if it was true, that'd be really significant because it would indicate that Saddam Hussein was seeking to reconstitute his nuclear program. And he came back and he was debriefed by the intelligence, CIA intelligence analyst. He's like, no, there's nothing there. And he thought that he had done his job as an American. He had these deep, longstanding ties in Africa where he could go and ask those questions. But finally, in July 2003, he wrote the op-ed. I knew about it. You know, he was been speaking out very publicly, very strongly against the war in Iraq. So he was very active. And when I read the op-ed, I was proud of him, but I certainly, neither one of us had any idea of what it would cause because I felt that my cover was secure. And he had already been quite a public figure. He had served in Iraq. He had served in Africa. There's lots of reasons why he had a lot of credibility. And he had dealt with Saddam Hussein during the first Gulf War. First President Bush called him a genuine American hero. So there were a lot of reasons for him to write this op-ed piece and that they would publish it in the New York Times. It had nothing to do at all with his spouse, who happened to work for the CIA. But a week later, in a column by conservative columnist Robert Novak, he out he took exception to this op-ed and sort of said on the margin, oh, and by the way, his wife, Valerie Plain, works for the CIA. And we now know that he was fed that information by several senior White House officials. But at the time, it just, the whole thing just hit at a particular moment in time when the American public was sort of opening their eyes and going, wait a minute, I thought you told us that there was going to be WMD in Iraq. And there's not, there's not at all. In fact, they're just looting at the museum. It's just completely 
unhinged. You know, the wheels are coming off. What's going on? And I think the Bush administration was feeling for that particular moment in time, very vulnerable. And they decided to go after Joe Wilson and Valerie Plame. And it didn't have to be. They could have been just a one day story and, you know, move on. But they felt obviously very threatened by Ambassador Joe Wilson. Okay, this next interview I'm extremely excited to share with you. Regular listeners of the podcast will know the special place in my heart that the great sport of boxing has. I had the great honor of interviewing HBO boxing legend Jim Lampley. In this clip from the interview, he shares his first-hand experiences covering, for ABC Sports, the 1980 Winter Olympics in Lake Placid. Here, we relive the magic of the miracle on ice and the thrilling moments that captivated the world. I'd love for you to tell our listeners um, what you've called your favorite Olympic memory uh, having to do with your experience at Lake Placid, 1980. So, um, my job at Lake Placid in 1980, and uh, you may recall that that was a game where global politics and Olympic politics largely overshadowed uh, what was happening in the competition because the, the huge question overhanging those games was would the United States choose to uh, boycott the Moscow Olympics later that summer uh, because of the presence of Soviet tanks in, ironically, Afghanistan. Uh, <laughs> they made that mistake before yes. we made that mistake. Uh, <laughs> and Carter administration was looking for vehicles to try to globally embarrass the Soviets and get them to pull out of uh, Afghanistan. And my my original assignment at Lake Placid was bobsled and luge. Uh, but a very brilliant and skillful producer named Terry O'Neill went to Arledge, uh, and said, Hey, we're wasting Jim if we have him covering bobsleds at Luch. Jim should be your news and sports reporter, both for all of the organizational snafus and difficulties that the games are going to face. And, and they wound up with hundreds, if not thousands of people who had bought tickets and were entitled to go to the events, standing and waiting in parking lots for uh, buses that never showed up, freezing. It said it was a horribly run Olympics with all sorts of organizational snafus. That was my beat. Um, the global politics thing with International Olympic Committee meetings and um, Hotting Carter, who was then an assistant secretary of state, shuttling back and forth from uh, Washington to Lake Placid to talk to those people. That was one of my assignments. Um, and on the Friday of the second week, while the United States was playing the Soviet Union in a five o'clock game, um, both ABC and the United States Olympic Committee had gone to the IOC to try to move the game to prime time. Look at this. It's in, in effect a stepping stone to the gold medal. It's the United States versus Soviet Union. You're crazy not to have it in prime time. And the Soviets said, schedule has always said that the game is at 5 p.m. We'll be there to play at 5 p.m. If you don't, you're going to default. Uh, and so the, the game was taking place at 5. And at 5 p.m., I was in a tape room with a uh, producer and a tape editor putting together a compendium of all of the reports I had done during the preceding 12, 13 days, and that was going to air on the closing ceremony show on Sunday. And we had at the top left of our edit day a tiny monitor on which we were watching the United States versus Soviet Union in hockey. And we paused and watched at the end of the first period, in the last 30 seconds of the first period, when a puck got loose in the Soviet end, and a kid named Mark Johnson, tiny wing who was for two weeks the hottest goal scorer in the world, mm -hmm. chased that puck and poked it under Vladislav Tretiak's glove to tie the score at 2-2. Two to two. Now, Arledge was always known for his so-called golden gut. The ability to foresee in advance that something significant or major was going to happen and how it should be covered. And about 
15 seconds after Johnson scored the goal to make it 2-2. The red phone in our edit bay rang. Now, and now every facility at ABC Sports in those days, whether it was a truck or an edit bay or a, an office, wherever it was, there was a red phone. The red phone was the Arledge phone. The only person who could possibly ring you on a red phone line was Ren Arledge. So the red phone is ringing now, 15 seconds after the gold, it makes it 2-2. Two, two. And the producer and the editor and I all look at each other, and both of them say, all yours. You're the senior person. Uh, and, and I say, okay, I guess so. And I pick up the red phone. Hello. Rune says, is Jim Lampley there? I said, yes, this is Rune. This is Jim Rune. What's up? He said, what are you doing? And I told him what I was doing and the reason why. He said, drop that. Go over to the hockey arena. I need you to get in. Uh, I have a wild hunch that something amazing is going to happen in this game. If that turns out to be the case, we're going to need to get an interview, a significant interview, and I'm trusting you to figure that out. The last thing I said to him was, um, Rune, oh, he said, you're on, you're our most important asset now. Wow. The last thing I said was, Rune, I don't have the credential to get into the hockey. And in those days, we're eight years removed from Munich. If yeah. you don't have the right credential for an event, there, there's very little chance you're going to get in. Right. And I said, Rune, I don't have the right credential to get into hockey, thinking he would send me somebody or something. He says, you'll get in and hangs up the phone. So uh, I walk 500 yards maybe from the edit facility and TV broadcast center to the high school arena where the hockey is taking place. I get to the door of the hockey arena, and the first person I run into is the venue manager, who's the high school hockey coach in charge of that arena. And by sheer coincidence, uh, because my agent was a hockey agent named Dark Kaminsky, I had met that guy two or three days before. Hmm. Explained my situation to him. He said, I'll let you in. So now I go in. I have to find a place to watch the game. Uh, and I wind up standing on a camera platform behind the two main coverage cameras. Uh, and I have to be totally still so that I'm not causing their cameras to shake and therefore their shot to wiggle uh, while they're covering the game. And I notice that there's one other guy on that platform who doesn't belong there. And he's wearing a green navy peacoat, and he's got long kind of greasy hair. Takes me a while to figure it out. But eventually I realized this is the famous folk singer Harry Chapin, who had done a concert uh, at the Olympic Village the night before. And now we are companions watching the hockey game. Second period uh, goes by. Soviets score a goal, and then Buzzy Schneider, uh, I believe, scores a slap shot from uh, the uh, the blue line. And now we go into the third period, and it's three to three. And uh, as we are finishing the second period, um, I turn and kind of hug Chapin. We haven't even spoken to each other yet, but we have a kind of a hug. Both cameramen turn around and say, don't shake the cameras. Okay, <laughs> all right. So now we both go off, talk to somebody, do something during the period gap and come back as the third period begins. And, of course, you know what happens in the third period. The U.S. team is depending a little bit. For anybody who doesn't know, go to YouTube. Uh, It's one of the most momentous and spectacularly inexplicable and exciting things ever to happen in American sports. And when that enormous celebration is ebbing, the whole thing is over, I realize, oh my God, the players are now headed into the dressing room and I have to somehow find somebody to interview because Arledge told me that if this happens, I'm going to be closing the show with uh, an interview tonight. They booked time at the end to uh, to make that possible. So I go down. I get into a hallway outside the uh, dressing room, and now I begin to watch the American players come out one on one after another from the dressing room. And it's chaos. There are cameras. There are reporters. And I'm on one side, and they are exiting and going out the door toward the other side. 
and I recognize some of them. Some of them I don't, and I'm just yelling, hey, 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 you know, you know, hey, hey, Ken Morrow, hey, uh, you know, Jimmy Craig, et cetera, and I'm yelling and yelling, and nobody hears me because of the chaos. And the last player out was a Ruzioni. We had the same agent. I had met him a few days ago, and when I, the same day that I had met the high school hockey coach, and this time when I yell, Mike, 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 he recognizes my voice. So Mike turns around and comes over to me, and I said, Mike, Oh my God, you know, I said he's exciting as hell, right? Yeah, congratulations. I said, Mike, what are you doing? I, I need to interview you. I have to have an interview. He said, no, I can't do that. I'm going to dinner with Jimmy Craig and his dad at such and such a restaurant. I said, guess who's paying for dinner? <laughs> uh, and so I managed to go with them and then at the end of the evening, take them both out of the restaurant, go stand on the street, uh, in front of the restaurant to do uh, that interview and, uh, about 15 seconds before McKay throws it to me, Mike looks at me and says, Jim, look around behind you. And there are 5,000 people on the street behind us because they see the camera, they see Jimmy and Mike, da 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 da. And, uh, and I look back and I say, pretty wild. And Mike says, if we had stood here last night, all three of us, if we had stood in this position last night, and I said, nobody would have recognized. He said, exactly. Nobody would have paid a bit of attention. And, and there we were. Um, and over the years since that time, I have run into Jimmy and Mike many, many times at Olympic gatherings and, you know, post-Olympic uh, events and stuff of that nature. And every time. Every time I run into Mike, and I hope I do again, but I mm. don't know, uh, he, um, uh, I say to him, I say to Mike, it's now a scripted moment. I say, Mike, you know, because of the miracle of videotape, you are now the most prolific scorer in the history of hockey. Mm. Uh, and he <laughs> always says to me, Lamps keeps going in, doesn't it? <laughs> and that's it. It does keep going in every time. And to anybody who says that wasn't a miracle, I can give you the long story. That was a miracle. That couldn't happen, but it did. On a more somber note, I interviewed writer Eugene Smith. Eugene is a survivor of the infamous Jonestown cult and tragically lost his mother his wife, and his son at the massacre in the jungles of Guyana. What would you say is the biggest, the most widespread misconception about Jonestown? That everybody, that, that everybody died willingly. It's been disproven, but it's never been uh, prophesized <laughs> in a way that it should be. Sure. Uh, because, they, you know, people were injected in, in all sorts, all sorts of parts of their body, you know, which meant that they were, they were running or fleeing. Right. Um, not everybody was in the pavilion. Even when they did the, even when they arranged the bodies after the fact, they were outside the pavilion. Um, even in some of the last recordings, they said, oh, hell no. We, no, that's not what we're like. We fight. We fight. Um, it was not, it was not a hundred percent agreed upon. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's the biggest misconception is that everybody did this willingly and that, and that those that survived, either they were special, special in the sense that, you no, know, they had privileges others didn't. Or they were special in the sense that um, they were meant to carry on the message, mm. uh, which is all it's like no way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it took it took years in the sense that uh, when we first came back, the first thing you did was shut your mouth. You didn't say nothing to nobody about anything, and if you could, if you weren't. If, you, if your picture wasn't blasted all over the news, you try to keep it secretive as you can. Um, 
The difference is, and I keep going back to this, depending on when you came in, dictated how you reacted when you came back. You know, from, from, a, from a child to a teenager to an adult, your world was gone because you had nothing before that. If you came in as an adult, you had a life prior. You searched for that, the life prior. If you came in as a senior, which meant that like in 1978, you might have been born in 1900. Or you might have been born in the 1800s. Um, you had nothing to come back to because you're not going to be respected to the same extent because you should have known better. The other thing is, is that you're a senior citizen and that uh, you're not going to be honored. You're going to get put in a rest home, convalescent home, or you might even be jet just for being what they consider crazy. So, so the, like I said, so when you join, how you join dictated how you, how you responded after that was gone. If you had any life before, you tried to return to that. Uh, if you didn't have any life before, you tried to create a new life without these people. We were monitored for 10 years after the fact. Our files were still open. So it's like, it wasn't, it wasn't like you just had like, okay, well, you're free now. No, right. no, you're not. No, you're not. One of my favorite bands is Fleetwood Mac. I interviewed Ken Kelly. He is a record producer who produced some of Fleetwood Mac's most famous albums, including Rumors. I'd love to know, can you take me through the experience of winning a, a Grammy and what that was like? It's not often I get to speak with a, a Grammy winner. Well, that's, I mean, you know, it was it was such a, a weird year. And uh, um, once we released the record, uh, I guess it was released three mo- two months after we finished it in we finished in, we started in January 75 and we ended in January 77 or 76. No, we worked all through 76. Yeah, January 77, we finished mixing. But, and, and I would believe it was the, the rumors came out three days ago, 45 years ago on Jan- February 4th, 77. And, and it was, it was an immediate, a hit. It was, you know, it's, it, when Fleetwood Mac decided and, and told me that I was, uh, going to be the, a, the labeled a producer for the record, which means, which means you, if the record sells something, you might make, you, you gets a few cents here and there. But so I thought, well, yeah, right. You know, none of my other records have sold anything, you know, and I got nothing. So little did I know that I won the lotto on that, but it was funny. So, and after the record was released, I remember I was walking out of the camera store. I finally had some free time to get my camera fixed and I got into the car and KLOS was, was playing, was going to play the rumors album in its entirety. They said the DJ, I just turned the key on my dog was in the car and, and he says, now I'm going to play this album. It's amazing. We're gonna, it sounds great. Turn it up and I want you to enjoy the whole thing. And, I, and all of a sudden he played my album on the, on the radio. And it's like that I had played so many times that I'm sitting there by myself, no cell phone. I'm going to, Hey, come here. Ah, you know, it's amazing. And so that was just really a thrill, uh, being a part of that and, and, um, so, so, so that was that kind of excitement. So when I went to the Grammys and I got the Grammy award, I was sitting with the whole band and we, we had, we had got heard all these accolades for, well, it was a year later. So we had heard a lot of them. Um, but, but when they called Fleetwood Mac as the producers of the year, um, we were also nominated for best engineered album. Mm-hmm. And when that Steely Dan got it, but anyway, so we had gotten up. Fleetwood Mac had gotten up a bunch of times for album of the year and different things that we won. And so when it was the the finally for when it came to the producer of the year, they we all stood up, and and then Fleetwood Mac sat down. It was like a joke. Let's let's put Dan and Richard walk up to this 
to the podium by ourselves. <laughs> we walk up to the podium, you know, figuring the band's right there and looking around. There's no band. <laughs> and I look, and they're like, just laughing. They're just cracking up, you know. Pick up the award for us. <laughs> anyway, so that was pretty cool. Next up, I had the pleasure of interviewing the two DEA agents who took down drug kingpin Pablo Escobar, Steve Murphy and Javier Pina. The hit Netflix show Narcos is based on their accomplishments and their work taking down the Medellin cartel. One thing that fascinates me about the whole Pablo Escobar um, saga is how uh, loved he was by the Colombian people. Uh, and this won't be a surprise to either of you, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, successfully ran for Congress. So he was seen as so, sort of like a Robin Hood. Uh, not completely unfairly. He gave money to the poor and so forth. Um, but I am curious, would it be fair to say that this, uh, Avianca bombing was so, something like a turning point in the general perception of him? Now, the, the real turning point was when he killed Galan, the leading presidential candidate. But um, I'm glad you brought that up about the, this Robin Hood myth, because we like to address that. Great. Um, he and like you said, he did do some good things. He gave money to the poor. He built clinics. He built housing, free housing for people who were living on the edge of the trash dump. He gave away food. He built uh, soccer fields, you know, and I, <laughs> I mean, he did really good things. And, and if it had stopped at that, well, that would be a magnanimous thing to do. However. As he's battling the government, his Sicarios, and, you know, at one point had as many as 500 Sicarios protecting him. As if Sicarios are being killed, when he needed to recruit new people, where do you think he went? He went right back into those communas where he had given these people what they have. They think he walks on water. Like Javier said, they, you know, he loved them. They loved him. They made no bones about it. They were willing to kill for Pablo. They were willing to die for Pablo. And so he might, he might meet these, these young people. And say, you know, after after all the niceties and pleasantries and all that, he'd say, listen, my friends, Pablo needs, I don't know, 40 people who are willing to come and fight for me, fight to do the right thing. You know, and he'd give them his little public spiel. And the sad thing is a couple hundred kids might step up. And so these are the new Sicarios. And these kids are in range, range in an age from maybe 14 to 22, 23 years old. It's like Javier told you, the the, the one kid that he was in on the arrest where the guy – you know, opened up and told Javier about his life. He said he doesn't expect to live older than that. He failed, he just feels that he'll be dead by then. So it, it just, what we say that rather than him being a Robin Hood, he was a master manipulator. Yes. He manipulated those people to get what he wanted where he gave them something nice, but there's always a payback. You know, the payback though is you're willing to give your life to die for this guy. I'm trying to clean up my language there. Sorry. No, not a problem. Perhaps, perhaps more of a Pied Piper than a Robin Hood. Will that do? <laughs> um, I, I can think of other terms, but I won't say them in the podcast. <laughs> Up next, I want to bring you an interview that I did with podcasting star Jordan Harbinger. Jordan will no doubt be known to many of you as the host of the ultra popular Jordan Harbinger Show. Here, we go through his experiences as a frequent traveler and observer. Of North Korea, we discuss the cult of personality that surrounds the Hermit Kingdom. I'm, I'm fighting the urge. I, I really want to be the one interviewer in history that doesn't mention George Orwell or 1984. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, but it's it's extraordinary to think about the totalitarian regime and how it really is made manifest. Uh, so you know, to that point, obviously, so much of the DPRK is centered around a cult of personality. Right. Mm -hmm. We have the dear leader, the great leader, et cetera. Um, I would imagine you'd see his face everywhere. You've already alluded to it with the mural. Um, and I know you had an interesting experience uh, with a magazine that bore, I think it was Kim Jong-il's face and an ashtray when you uh, yeah. went to put the magazine cover on it. Yeah, maybe you could run through Lots that. Lots of little totalitarian cult of personality, crazy stuff like this has happened in North Korea and to me over the years. So. I took one of the magazines from the airplane, no problem. They're also in the hotel, whatever. And it had Kim Jong-il's face on it. He was the son of the original founder of North Korea, Kim Il-sung. So in, in most of the magazines do. And I wanted more space on my desk. So I put it on a table. Uh, I took the ashtray off the desk, put that on the table. I had some coins. I put those in the ashtray. 
Um, they were like, you know, Chinese money or whatever. I put some other, I put a bag on top of that. And these were all on top of the magazine. I thought nothing of it. It was like an issue of Time magazine that you'd already read. Who cares? Sure. Right. Huh. And I also thought maybe I'll take these home. And so I'll keep them in good condition by putting stuff on them that isn't going to damage them, like an ashtray with coins in it in a bag. Well, when I came back to my room, the magazine was gone. And the cleaning staff had come and turned the bed down and all that other stuff. But everything else had been laid on the table where I left it. And I was like, where is the magazine? And the next day, I took more magazines because I wanted them. I found them in the hotel or wherever the, wherever we got them. I can't quite remember. Sure. I took them, and I took a stack of two or three, and I did the same thing. I put them on the table, but then I put the ashtray back on it because I don't want to take up all the dang real estate in my room. And then when I came back the next day, the magazine were were also gone. And I was like, what the hell? So then I thought, oh, I wonder if it's because I put something on top of the magazine. So I got another copy of one of the magazines because now I'm experimenting. And I put it on my desk and I didn't put anything on it or around it. And I put a, I, I had another one from my bag, which I put on the table with not I did not put the ashtray on top of it. I did not put the bag on top of it. And when I came back to my room, they were both there. So I th- that was sort of all I needed to know. They found it offensive that I had put an ashtray on top of their leader's photo, and they had decided that I wasn't allowed to keep the magazine. And I've had similar things like this happen. I was writing something on the airplane. The time I got seated next to a North Korean in the back of the airplane, I needed a pen. He lent me a pen. I started writing on something, but I had folded the newspaper shut, and I started writing on the paper that I had on top of the newspaper and he said no 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 you cannot huh. write you cannot use the newspaper as a writing surface even if you're not writing on it because it will and I, he's telling me in korean i did not understand what how, how he was doing but basically he didn't want the pen pressure to damage it was like a re-entry form for china you know i'm not writing a diary entry it was nothing objectionable to the content that i was writing he didn't want me to write on the surface that might then dent the photo and make it not reflect all glossy and because it had Kim Jong Un's face on it, wow. and I was like, "Geez, man, you guys are ridiculous." They treat they treat every photo of this guy like it's the Shroud of Turin or something. I mean, it's just completely ridiculous. Last but not least, I want to showcase an interview that I did with Spike Edney. Spike has been the keyboardist for Queen since 1984, and we discuss what it was like performing the infamous set at Live Aid in 1985. Talk to me a little bit about the energy inside Wembley at the time while you're on stage. Can you recall what you were feeling? Um, It was very exciting um, because once we played uh, Radio Gaga with the hand clap, I think Gaga was the second tune. Mm -hmm. And if I was nervous, I wasn't too nervous because I kind of, you know, had faith that we would go over okay because we were match fit uh, and had been touring and knew that what the audience response would be to certain uh, pieces of music. Um, and, of course, starting off with Bo Rap, that got everybody's attention and they all went crazy. But then going into Gaga, uh, my only concern was that I have to uh, control the synthesizer part and uh that goes all the way through it and uh, i have to play that and um i was just concerned that nothing went wrong with that because uh, earlier in the tour i had some issues mm. with the uh, keyboard and it had, uh, had been a problem and my hand slipped on one of the controls and <laughs> created chaos it was all it's all stupidity and an op- operator error it wasn't the keyboard itself it was my uh my handling of it that was wrong but um but that had been uh, quite a while before and I would got my routine down and learned what to do and what not to do in order to keep it in pristine readiness. And uh, so when we got to the Gaga and I pressed the key that starts off that uh, introduction, my heart was in my mouth, to tell you the truth, because if it hadn't worked, then, then uh, well, I just don't know that the alternative keep, keep me awake at night. Um, Anyway, it worked perfectly, and they all clapped and joined in. And then I thought, okay, we're good um, to get that kind of reaction on the second song because we get. I knew that we had, we were rocky, and we were the champions to come. So it was a done deal. Fish in a barrel uh, after that. 
Thank you for tuning in, listeners. Remember, you can find, download, subscribe to the Eyewitness History Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Parthenonpodcast.com, or the podcast player of your choice. Thanks for listening.